What a great intro. <laughs> Hello everyone, welcome to the channel. My name is Cordant and it is time, my friends. It is time to start our playthrough of Pillars of Eternity 2 Deadfire. So we are just coming from finishing a playthrough of Pillars of Eternity 1 for the Triple Crown achievement. Uh, we completed it with a rogue main character and only using story companions throughout the entire game. Um, we were able to complete the game, we defeated Mr. Theos X Arcanon. Uh, all of our companions lived through the entire journey, we didn't lose anyone along the way, and we used no custom companions. So we got to explore the, the story, the quests, all of the stuff from our companions throughout the entire game. So we were able to complete the White March Part 1, we were able to complete the White March Part 2, all of the big bosses, all of the bounties, and naturally also the main campaign. It was a, a very excellent run, I had a lot of fun making that run. Uh, it was even more enjoyable by being accompanied by you guys and seeing the feedback and questions and suggestions in the comments, so it just made the experience all the better. So thank you so much for everyone that stuck around for that playthrough. Uh, it, it really was very enjoyable. Uh, in case you guys didn't, ch didn't check it out, I'm gonna leave a link up here for that playthrough. It was very, very fun. But now it is time to take our main character, our Mr. Tiny Mustache Man, the Orlan Rogue, and we are going to import it into Pillars of Eternity 2 to play the game with a continuation of that character. So, just something I want to mention here that's going to be a difference from that playthrough to this one. Uh, PoE 1, I played it, like I said, with Triple Crown difficulty settings because I had already finished that achievement twice before. I was very uh, accustomed to the game, I was familiar with the mechanics and the encounters, so I felt confident in doing that for a video series. This one I haven't played before. Uh, from memory, which was a long time ago, I think I've only explored the initial area, which I think is like an island, and then I got on a boat and I stopped playing. <laughs> I don't even remember why. But it's gonna be different, okay? For, for the most part of this game, for the majority of this playthrough, I'm gonna be playing it blind. Um, I did test out a little bit of the initial area of the game again because I didn't want to make a fool of myself <laughs> in the initial episodes because I remember it being quite hard. Um, but everything that was story related, every dialogue, cutscene, anything like that, I skipped through because I want to have a fresh experience for these videos. So everything I'm going to be seeing here is going to be seen for the first time in terms of story and lore. So, something I want to show before we start, just looking over the options. Uh, I didn't change much, but I, I ticked this option here, show PoE1 reactivity. So this will display when a response relates to a decision made in PoE1. I'm curious to see how my decisions in the first game affect the second game, so I'm going to leave this on just so I can see how it works out. And then, in auto-pause, I just set this to my liking, you can choose whatever you prefer. But I like having the game auto-pause when an enemy is spotted, and also stop the party movement. The same thing for traps, so I don't get killed by traps. And the same thing for hidden objects, because uh, a lot of times, one of my party members might find a hidden object, but if the game doesn't stop to tell me, look, there's a hidden object over there, I'm gonna forget about it, I'm gonna skip through it and never pick it up. So <laughs> that's just for, for my own sake. And then naturally also when the combat starts. Other than that, I didn't really mess around with any other settings. The interface is the default one. Uh, this one left me curious because I think it's listing out all of the possible achievements in the game, but it kind of gives them like a, a score, which I'm not sure what it's supposed to mean. You even have a total here, but I guess if you want to, um, if you want to complete all achievements, at least you have a list here that you can look for instead of just blindly going through the game, through the game and trying to find them. In terms of mods, it's the first time I'm going to be playing through this game, so I want to play it unmodded. And this section here, I guess, is if you want to create uh, a PoE one story 
like if you've played the first game on a console and you want to play the second one on PC and you don't have a save game to import, I'm guessing this is how you would simulate that. Um, okay, so those are my changes here, Not nothing major. So let's start a new game. So in PoE2, we can actually choose between real time with pause or turn based combat. Uh, I would say this is mostly up to personal preference. I myself enjoy real time with pause and I want to experience the game with real time with pause. That's my preferred method. Um, I, I do hope that in runtime, while the game is playing, I can change between them at will in case I find some kind of fight where I might want to see it in turn base. It would be cool if I could change it mid game. For now, we're going to be picking real time with pause. And for our new game settings, in terms of difficulty, we are going to be playing in Path of the Damned, which is the highest one. Path of the Damned throws the largest number of enemies against the player, makes enemies more powerful, and utilizes the most devious AI tactics. Warning, this option is only intended for players who want the most punishing encounters. And we do want those. In terms of gameplay modifications, so in PoE 1, I played with Trial of Iron and Expert Mode enabled as well for the Triple Crown achievement. Uh, but in this case, and I'm going to read this in case you don't know it, in Trial of Iron Mode, only one save file is kept for the entire playthrough. If the party is killed, the file is deleted and you must start again. This option cannot be changed in game. Like I said, I'm not familiar with PoE 2. I'm not going to be turning this on to be super um, confident and then just dying on episode 5. I don't think anybody wants to see that. So I'm going to leave this on at least for my first playthrough. And then we also have expert mode, which will disable a number of helper features in the game. So same reasoning as for Trial of Iron. I don't know this game that well. I don't know if there are different spells or if they be behave differently. So I am going to leave this off as well. In terms of level scaling, however, Level scaling provides a consistent level of challenge to players when exploring Deadfire. While enabled, enemies within a scene will adjust their level up or down depending on the player character's level relative to the intended level for the scene. So here, I am going to give level scaling to every single thing in the game, but I only want it to scale upwards. So what this means is, if I arrive at a very challenging area with a low level party, I don't want that content to be scaled down. I want to play it at the difficulty it was intended to be or higher. If I find that it's too high level for me, I'm just going to go back later. I prefer that rather than scaling down the difficulty. So these are my options. Path of the Damned, Trial of Iron and Expert Mode off, level scaling on everything and only scale upwards. Let's start the game. And I have to say that the music in PoE2 is still stellar. The music in these games is really, really fitting. Very well done. Aora, a world where mortals live, die, and are reborn through the turning of the wheel. The cycle of reincarnation watched over by the gods and made possible through pillars of a mystical substance known as Audra. Five years ago, you traveled from your home to the Deerwood, a nation that had waged war against the incarnated god of light, Aethys, resulting in his destruction. The country suffered from a plague of Hollowborn, infants born without souls that many believed was punishment for killing a god. In an ancient, secluded ruin, you witnessed a secret ritual that inadvertently transformed you into a Watcher. One who can see and speak with souls. The ritual also gave you horrible visions waking nightmares of a past life that threatened your sanity. To put them to rest, you pursued the man who had led the ritual, 
a seemingly immortal agent of the gods, known as Theos Ix Arcanon. With divine assistance, you confronted and defeated Theos, ending your visions and resolving the Hollowborn Crisis. In so doing, you also learned the great secret that Theos had protected. That the ancient empire of Anguith had transformed themselves into gods. Your visions finally put to rest, you retired to the castle of Cadnua, built atop a massive statue of pure Audra, where you ruled in relative peace and prosperity. That's actually a pretty good summary of the first game. Made a nice story. It did. Fixing up that old keep, lifting the curse. I love his voice. <laughs> Must have told it a hundred times. But something got to gnaw at me. Thinking the spirits there weren't really at rest. But maybe the gods weren't finished with us. Oh. This is Ked Nua. Oh, okay. I used to dream that when my god came back, he would forgive us. the trouble with dreams. Sooner or later, we all have to wake up. Oh, well, it doesn't look very forgiving. Is that supposed to be me? The watcher lying on the ground? Did I die? So you wake to a sleepless world. I did. The in-between of life and death. Follow your memories. You have been here before. Okay, so what it looks like to me is that the other structure beneath Cadnua rose up and started destroying stuff and killing people and I think the Watcher, us, I think we died there. And our soul is now in the in-between. Which is like heaven, in a way. You have seen past the shroud. You are a watcher now. And a watcher you will stay. So th this is the, the old dwarf woman that we found hanged in the Gilded Vale when you start the game. The first one, I mean. A watcher sees souls. Knows their pasts, and the souls see them back. This is Mayrwald. He's also, or he was also a Watcher. He told us about some things in Kednua, but he had gone kind of insane with all of the visions of his past lives. Or the souls that he was seeing. A dubious honor, inheriting a fortress both broken and cursed. This is the steward. So when we defeated Mayrwald, because like I said, he had gone insane, we gained, um, we inherited control over Cadnua. And the steward was a statue there, which started helping us out, because we were the new lords of Cadnua. What is a god? Hmm? A higher power? A rewarder of good deeds and punisher of the wicked? This is our nemesis. This is like the, the final boss of the first game, Theos X Arcanon. The gods aren't real, but something else entirely. Something created by people. So yeah, so this is referring to... In the world of, of Iora, there are gods but not in the sense that you usually might think about them. Uh, you learn at the end of the game that the gods are actually, just like the narrator told us in the, in the intro, they were the old Inguithan uh, 
people, rulers, something, that transform themselves into gods to rule over the people of this world. And did you ever consider that these were things you were never meant to understand? That their comprehension is beyond you? Yeah, this is Theos once again in, in Sun and Shadow, the final area of the first game. Let the world see. Let them decide what to do. Yeah, okay, and this, this is Iovara. She's the one that told us about the gods not being real. Oh, nice. So this is like a representation of the turning of the wheel. Our soul is going to be given new purpose in a different body. An aged dwarf shares this strange floating platform with you. His face is creased by so many wrinkles that his features lie buried amid shadowy pockets of skin. Still, the dwarf's well-practiced habits have left telltale tracks of a welcoming rictus across his visage. I do enjoy the the different graphics in, in this game, they're very pretty. And just if anybody doesn't know from Pillars of Eternity 1, so this is representing the turning of the wheel. So when you die, your soul gets sent into the in-between, which is where we are right now, and every once in a while there's a, a turning of the wheel where your soul gets sent back into the world for a new purpose. So if uh, a baby was born, this soul would go into that new life form, but the baby or the person would never know of this soul's past lives. But if you were awakened or if you were a watcher, then you could see those past lives while living your own, which is our case. You can see his smile coming before it blooms, reshaping the dwarf's face from a hanging sack of flesh into something resembling an oddly carved Mary Gore, replete with unhealthy bumps and discolored splotches. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay, we're, we're playing. Thank you, Mr. Dwarf. I love this. Sit. Please. So, like I said before, I, I did play this initial area before because that's the option you get if you just say skip intro. Because I, I skipped all of the dialogue and all of the cutscenes just so I could get into the game and get accustomed to the mechanics. So this is all new. <laughs> okay. Thank you for joining us, Watcher of Cad Newer. The gaunt woman, the gaunt woman oh. seated at the table is clad in time-worn black armor that seems too massive for her to move in. So I guess even these observations are also narrated. Yeah, it's actually cool for my throat, but it, it might be a little bit weird. I gotta get accustomed to it. A pale, slender neck rises from the gorget, topped by a hollow face. The milky skin stretched across it is delicate and translucent like parchment that has been scraped clean too many times. Mm. She is preoccupied with the arrangement of cards on the table between you. With each movement, her armor squeaks and groans as though bearing an incredible weight. She places a final card, gives a nod of satisfaction, and raises her eyes to meet yours. Your brush with the divine oh. has drained you of your powers, fractured your memories, Look upon these cards. They represent the courses of your life. You alone know best how they flowed. Arrange them to fit what you remember. Okay, so I guess it, it all makes sense, right? If, if you look at this, a gaunt woman, pale and slender, milky white skin. Yeah, this is a pallid knight. The pallid knight is Berath, the god of death. I'm, I wonder if she's showing up here because we sided with her in PoE 1. B because, yeah, in, in PoE 1 at the end we have to... Um, or you can, actually, you don't have to. Um, we chose a god to help us get into the sun and shadow, which was like the, the last area of the game. 
and they ask a favor in return. And I did complete, I, I did fulfill that promise. So I wonder if she's showing up because she's the god that I chose, or if it's simply because she's the goddess of death and this is the in-between and the turning of the cycle, so she's the one responsible for it. Maybe it's just a coincidence. Anyway, I, I, I love the fact that we're talking to Berath. So let's examine the cards to choose our legacy. Ah, okay. So select which history took place during Pillars of Eternity or select the Pillars of Eternity in-game save to import. Ta -ta. If you wish to create a custom history, you may do so from options on the main menu, the stuff we, cho uh, we, we saw before. And we also have a couple of options here. Pledge to Helia, you were kind and merciful. Pledge to Berath. Okay. Galloway, Rimmergand, and this would be Wodica, or, or everything bad. Nice. Not so good for new players. So what is this? You did everything wrong. You pledged to the bidding of every god and then scattered the souls of the Hollowborn to a random location. You got every companion killed, Jesus. You got the worst outcome for every quest. If there is a mistake you could have made while still resolving the Hollowborn crisis, you made it. This could be a very interesting playthrough. <laughs> uh, and these, I think, are mostly just templates for a, um, a kind of... Uh, what's the word here that I'm looking for? A stereotypical style. So you were benevolent or you were fair and balanced, so kind of lawful. This is more chaotic, I guess. This is evil, maybe? Uh, but yeah, in our case, we're going to import our POE1 save, which is going to be this one. So in the lighthouse, act four, it took 140 hours to finish the first game. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, so trial of iron. Mm -hmm. We're going to load it. To be in order? I'm going to assume so. Yes. Good. Welcome to the beyond. I am Bera. One half, anyway. Half? She points a finger in the direction of the dwarf who led you here. Though the movement is slight, her gauntlet squeaks like a rusty hinge. I mean, I hope she, she makes a reference for us helping her in, in the first game. The dwarf's rictus returns as he nods in the woman's direction. The gods offered you boons in exchange for resolving the Hollowborn crisis. What did you do with the souls? Okay, so apparently this isn't uh, something that gets picked up from the save file. Okay. So you vowed to aid Berath, correct? We did. Oh. God of death, cycles, doorways, mortality, and inevitability. I love these pieces of lore. Just that sentence alone makes me want to play this game. The keeper of the cycle of life and death, Berath is taught to seek to claim the lives of those who have lived past their time. According to folklore, Berath is seen most often in the form of the Pallid Knight, or the Husher, two skeletal characters who lead such people to their deaths by way of challenge or trickery. Love it. So what do you do with the souls? And I return the souls to the wheel, I believe, which is, yeah, the choice for Berath. We also had the choice to return the, so the souls to the Hollowborn, this was for Helia. Strengthen the souls of the Deerwood, this would be the choice for Galloway. Disintegrated the souls, I believe, is Rimmergand. Disperse the souls randomly, I think, is Whale. And giving the souls to Wodica would be giving the souls to Wodica. Goddess of Justice, Law, Oaths, Promises, Rulership, Vengeance, Memory, and Hierarchies. It's kind of funny because r just reading this, it seems like she would be a a fair and lawful goddess, but she was very evil in the first game. Depicted as an old noblewoman, bearing a broken crown upon her head. Said to have once ruled over the other gods, but has since been overthrown. Yeah, I think she's salty about that. <laughs> so we return the souls to the wheel. Tell me, do you remember when we last met? Oh, and I think this is like a... This is a result of choices you made in Pills of Eternity. Okay, cool. I was gonna say yes in the Hall of Stars in Twin Helms, which is true. I... I think so. I pledged myself to do your bidding in exchange for your aid. Correct. Okay, so go with this one. And though you could have broken your pledge when you defeated Theos at Sun and Shadow, you did not. 
Admirable. Awesome. She delicately places a card on the table. A bell in a tower. Her fingertips slowly drag away from the card, faintly creaking as they retreat across the table. Okay. You had need of the gods once before. Now it seems we have need of you. Oh, is that right? The being that occupied Odnoa's statue beneath your castle was the dead god, Aethys. Oh. Of this, we are certain. What we do not know is what his intentions are. Okay, so this was this was the god they killed. Like in in the beginning of the first game, the story is that, that the people killed Aethus, and Durance was actually part of the of that killing. So Aethus is the god of rebirth, redemption, dawn, spring, and light. So I would read this, and I would think this is a good god, traditionally shown as a man bearing a candle and wearing a silver crown. Believed to have possessed the body of the Red Seren farmer Waidwen during the Saints' War and been destroyed along with Waidwen at the end of the war. He recently reformed his essence in the statue of Maros Nua beneath Ked Nua. In the process of pulling himself from the endless pots, he destroyed the castle and left the watch of Ked Nua at the brink of death. Hmm. Though Aethys stole a large fragment of your soul, you were strong enough to survive the onslaught ah. and enter the in-between. Okay, so we died, but our soul lost power, but wasn't disintegrated. You and he are still connected. He has chosen a body made of living Atra, perfused with the power of thousands of souls, including yours. It should be little difficulty for an experienced Watcher to find him. Okay, so am I dead? No, but neither is your body truly alive. Your lungs draw breath, your heart pumps blood, but your flesh is as soulless as a hollow wound. Uh... That is, until I return you. So Aethus didn't actually kill people, he stole souls. She delicately places a card upright on the table. The art depicts souls flowing out of a pillar of Audra. Okay, so wait. So she wants us to find him. I like to find him when she's in here. Well, I'd like to find him as much as you would. He destroyed my castle and killed who knows how many people around it. I know. It is my business to know. 322 in Kadnua and your surrounding lands. That's the death toll? God damn. So let's just read this because some people might not know this from the previous game. So Ked Nua was a wooden castle built over the ruins of the endless parts of Od Nua. Considered cursed, few ventured into its halls and even fewer made any effort to hold the castle or the lands around it. You became the de facto lord of the castle after defeating its previous master, the watcher called Merwald. As the Watcher of Kednua, you ruled the stronghold until it was destroyed by Eothas. The God of Light occupied the other body of Maros Nua beneath the castle and pulled himself out of the ground, destroying it in the process. Okay. Their souls remain in Eothas still. You have the power to save them. Serve me and I will return you to your body. Or don't. And return to the wheel. And let's just take a moment to, to appreciate something that was very, very well done in this game. Which is the fact that you can mouse over certain, you know, particularly important lore pieces and just read about them so you don't get lost. I love this. Okay, so we can either go back and try to save those souls or we can just return to the wheel. Uh, if I take the wheel, I imagine I will die. So let's, let's see what this does. I'll take the wheel. Unfortunate. This will prove much more difficult without someone of your unique talents and circumstances. She raises her gauntleted hand and gestures to the dwarf hovering at the periphery. The dwarf nods, the supernaturally wide smile returning to his face. He gestures for you to follow him. Uh, okay. Does this just end the... No sooner has Barith spoken than you feel yourself dissolve. 
It is not an unpleasant sensation. Something between falling asleep and drifting on a warm current. Your essence is pulled through the Audra, where it mingles with the stuff of thousands of other souls. Your thoughts, your memories, even your identity as the Watcher, fade like a dream. Eventually, your soul reforms and finds its way into a small, crawling thing of fur and claws. What? You know the world by sound and scent, as food and danger. The concerns of gods and nations are beyond you. It is a simple and satisfactory existence, though your mind can conceive of no other. Whether it is a long one will depend upon the Watcher Bareth chooses in your stead. Um. Uh. Yay! We finished. <laughs> we finished the game. Well, I could have played this in in Trial of Iron. Okay. Well, I wasn't expecting this to happen. Okay, so Path of the Damned, everything level scaled, only scale upwards. Let's start and skip the intro this time. <laughs> okay. They didn't need to bring me back to the menu. Well, if you ever want to speedrun Pillars 2, I would say that's a, that's a good bet <laughs> to speedrun the game. Just run to the chair and kill yourself. Awesome. Okay, so now we're gonna skip through this dialogue. Sit. Please. Yes, yes, I will sit. Sorry, I just wanted to check what it, what happened there. Thank you for joining us. A uh, your yeah, we're gonna import the save file, which is this one. Does everything appear good? Yes. The gods offered you We returned the souls to the wheel. Do you remember we chose this option. You had the beat, though, eh? you and he Am I dead? Delicately places a I would want to find them as much as you. Okay. You have the power to save them. Serve me and I will return you to your body. Or don't. And return to the wheel. Okay, so this time let's actually play the game. <laughs> let's get on with it. Good. Good. Before you return to Aora as my herald, you must remember who you were. The last whisper of life and death. For a moment, the sockets of her eyes darken, leaving the pits of a death's head gazing out at you. I must remember who I was. When you can picture your own face, the beyond will lead you back to your own kind, to the world of mortals. Oh, okay, I know what this is. So yeah, we get we get to create our character. So this one, even though it says import character, this is actually to choose a pre-made character to start with and modify as you like. I don't think this is a way for us to... Yeah, I, I, ca I cannot choose my, my previous character. We have to create it again. So we're gonna play as male. We're gonna play the same style we played in Pillars of Eternity 1. So we're gonna be an Orlan. We're gonna be... A Earth Orlan. Attack a target that is also being threatened by a teammate. They convert some of their hits to crits. I think this this got changed. I think in Pillars 1, this ability does not require another teammate to be threatening the target. I think you just have a passive conversion. But here you also have this, re this requisite. Would you like to make a single class or a multi-class character? So, single class characters are entirely focused on their chosen class. They gain access to higher level powers more quickly. Multi class characters can select powers from two classes but gain access to higher level powers more slowly and cannot access their class's highest level powers. So, even though it says it's not recommended for new players, I am going to multi class, but this I have investigated a little bit before starting the game. And the reason why I want to multi-class is for a very special reason. Well, first of all, because I think that a pure rogue, um, and you can even check out their abilities here. And this, I think, is, um, is a better way of doing it than in Pillars 1. Because in Pillars 1, you can't really uh, track or make a plan of what you want your build to be. It's not easily seen. You only discover new 
skills and talents as they come up when you level up. Here you get the entire level tree so you can check out what you need. So looking at this, I actually think that a, that a pure rogue could be a fun thing to have. But at the same time, I think I want to kind of uh, buff up some of our fighting prowess. Because this is all very sneaky and stealthy and all those things. But I also want to give it a bit of a buff in the just the raw power of using ranged weapons. But let's just go back over here. So in terms of classes, we have the same thing we had in Pillars 1. Uh, I think all the classes that are here also exist in the first game. Yeah, pretty sure there, there are. Uh, we get to see some of our uh, backstory here. What are rogues? We get a buff to some of our skills. And then we also have something here which is the roll, a striker. Strikers are unequaled in their ability to inflict large amounts of damage and crippling afflictions to single targets. Striker classes include the Cypher, the Druid, a Fighter, a Monk, a Ranger, a Rogue, and a Wizard. And we also have a resource, Guile. Rogue abilities require and consume Guile on use. Outside of combat, a Rogue's Guile is restored, ready to be used in the next encounter. So this is a major difference from Pillars of Eternity 1 to the second game, and something that I'm gonna take a while to get accustomed to, but... Uh, you have resources here to use your skills, something that you didn't have, at least for the rogue, in the first game. So like I said, we can preview our ability tree over here. We're not going to go over that right now, it's very massive. <laughs> Just going to pick rogue as our first class in the theme of what we played in the first game. And now we also have subclasses, which is quite cool. We can choose no subclass, and it's just a, a typical rogue. We also have the assassin. Assassins train to strike opponents who are completely unaware of their presence, often killing a hapless victim in a single blow. However, assassins are even more fragile than other rogues, making them vulnerable in toe-to-toe -to -toe fights. So, as a bonus, we gain the assassinate passive, which grants stealth attack bonus, uh, penetration, accuracy, and critical hit damage. So, penetration is also a different um, mechanic from the first game. When a damaging attack hits a target, the attack's penetration is compared to the target's armor rating to determine how much damage gets through. Penetration comes from the weapon or spell that is being used, but can be raised to the use of magic, abilities, talents or weapon enchantments. Penetration is compared to the armor rating of the attack's damage type, for example. A fireball will always check penetration against burden armor rating. Raw damage bypasses all armor and does not need to penetrate. So full penetration means plus 30% damage. Penetration is twice the target's armor rating or more. You have normal penetration, which is the listed damage. Penetration meets or exceeds the target's armor rating. Or you also have under penetration, which is minus 25% damage per point under the target's armor to a maximum of minus 75%. Penetration is less than the target's armor rating. So then you also have accuracy, which is the, the usual stuff, and you also have critical hit damage, which, again, same thing as before. A crit is any attack roll that is 100 or above. A crit that does damage increases the total damage done by 25% and the penetration of the attack by 50%. So I think the damage increase is less than the first game, but here it also augments the penetration, which is something that didn't exist before. I think it's the way they, they balance it. A crit on effects with the duration, typically afflictions like sickened or paralyzed, will increase the duration by 25%, which I think is also much less than the first game. I think in the first game it like doubled the duration. And the penalty for being an assassin is all damage received is increased. It doesn't say here how much. Does it say here? Assassin? No, it just says all damage received is increased. Don't know by how much. We also have a street fighter. Uh, excel when the odds are against them, becoming especially deadly when they are outnumbered and bloodied. Bloodied is just a state where you are when you... Uh, between 50% health and 25% health. So this means you want to play on a lower HP. 
more sneak attack damage when you are flanked or bloodied, which I think is something that we don't want to have on our particular character. There is a way to trigger flanked um, easily without being flanked by actual enemies by using a weapon model, but I, I don't want to exploit that. Well, it's not, it's not really an exploit, but I don't want to use that. That's not the style of play I want to go for my rogue. My rogue is going to be something, uh, someone using very, very accurate, very high damaging weapons to try to one-shot, or as close as possible, deal the highest amount of damage in the most accurate way possible to single targets. That's the idea for my rogue. So we also have a trickster, which is kind of like a, a fighter thief. You get some illusion wizard spells. And you also have the Debonair, which is kind of weird, uh, personally. <laughs> you get significant hit to crit uh, conversion against charm targets. I don't usually charm people. Uh, you also gain a, a charm ability, but you cannot engage and you gain the cowardice ability. So don't like this one. And I think the one that fits the most with what I just described is going to be the Assassin. So we're going to be even more of a glass cannon than we already were in Pillars 1. That's my choice. In terms of initial abilities, we can take Escape, allowing the rogue to break engagement and expertly avoid attacks, diving out of range to a specific location, so it's a, a defensive ability. Or we can take Crippling Strike. The rogue attacks their enemy's ability to move around effectively, hobbling any enemy um, successfully hit. And it also costs one guile, this is a resource. It uses the range of the weapon, deals bonus damage, which is relevant, and it also has bonus penetration. So, quite cool. I'm gonna pick this one now. And now we're gonna choose our second class. So, for the second class of a rogue that plays in the style that I just described, in my opinion, there are several options. So, I'm guessing that one of the options would be a Chanter, although this one is less conventional in my mind, because by going Chanter this means that while you are shooting people from afar, you can also be chanting, especially chants that reduce um, the ranged uh, recovery speed, as well as the reload speed, <clears throat> which are both very important for what I'm going for, so it would be a good uh, combination. And then you also have summons and stuff, but not really my style. You also have Fighter, because you have some abilities from the Fighter like um, increasing your accuracy or just becoming a little bit more sturdy or gaining extra penetration from certain abilities, which could also work. The Monk, same thing. You can, by using certain skills that the Monk has, you can gain wounds, which is a Monk mechanic, to just increase your might and your damage output throughout fights. So also a cool combination. Uh, the Paladins, especially with the Bleak Walkers, gain a very cool thing for a rogue, which is the... Um, where is this? The Flames of Devotion, which also allows you to deal very, very high damaging shots. Never tried it, but it sounds cool. And finally, you could also go for a wizard, but this is a little bit different in my mind. The one to keep in style with what I'm going for here is going to be the ranger. So, rangers are warriors of the woodlands and masters of the hunt. Always partnered with the soul-bounded animal companions, they can be found in wild spaces all over the world. As their lifestyles often tend toward independence and isolation, it is rare for rangers to become an integral part of a large fighting force, though they are often employed as scouts and guides. So, a ranger has a lot of abilities that complement my, my style for my rogue, because it's going to be a ranged rogue using especially um, gunpowder weapons. And you have stuff like marked prey, you have wounding shot, you have accurate wounding shot, which is more accuracy and more damage. You have stuff like Gunner, which makes you reload faster. You have... There's something else I want to mention here. Let me see if I can find it. 
Uh, what is it? Uh, driving flight. Each ranged attack loosed by the, the ranger contains such force to fly straight through the first target and hit another target behind it for less damage. If I'm going for a very damaging rogue, <laughs> this complements it very well. So there's a lot of stuff here that complements the, the style I'm going for. So I think it's going to be the best choice that I can have for a multi-class. But there's another reason for it. And it's a very, very important reason. Let's not forget. So I'm going to pick Ranger. And in terms of subclasses, you have a bunch of choices. So something I want to mention here, and this is actually what I, what I thought I was going to go for. You have the option to play with the Ghost Heart subclass. What this means is... Ghost hearts are rangers whose animal companions have died, but remained in the in-between as spirits to serve their masters. Ghost hearts can summon the spirit of their companion in combat for a limited duration. What does this mean? This means that by default you are playing without an animal companion. Which is something that can be very relevant. Because at least in Pillars 1, I could never really get accustomed to playing with a companion, especially when I took Sagani. Um, he always died, especially in Path of the Damned. Uh, I couldn't really control it that well. It's more micromanagement. Uh, and it's kind of a hassle. And then if he dies, the ranger gets a debuff and nobody wants that. So, if you don't like playing with an animal companion, but you like the ranger playstyle and the abilities, this would be the subclass for you. But, in my case, I'm actually going to go for the sharpshooter. Because, again, complements the style of the Assassin Rogue very well. Sharpshooters focus their attention entirely on ranged combat, relying on their animal companions to provide defense for them. Their penetration and accuracy with ranged weapons is superior, but they take more time to recover between attacks and have poor deflection. So, more time to recover between attacks is unfortunate. Naturally, that's not something that we want. And poor deflection we were gonna have anyway, so... <laughs> The bonus is, we get a bonus hit to crit conversion when attacking targets greater than 4 meters away, which in the ideal scenario and the typical scenario would be what we want to have. And then we also have bonus penetration when attacking targets which are closer. Can come in useful. The penalty is slow recovery time and lower deflection. Now, this complements my playstyle very well, but it also allows for something else. So the first thing we're gonna take is our ability here, and I'm gonna take the Wounding Shot for an extra damaging ability. And now, and this is the, the real cherry on top, we get to take Piggy with us. So for those who didn't see my adventures in Pillars of Eternity 1, um, my pet of choice for the entire playthrough was a tiny pig. He was a very good friend of mine, and he helped me throughout the entire journey. And I like to think of it that um, in the time between the events of Pillars of Eternity 1 and Pillars of Eternity 2, Mr. Piggy grew up to be a powerful boar companion. So we're going to be taking Mr. Piggy as our animal companion for our journey. And hopefully I can keep him alive. <laughs> Let's see. But yeah, so name is going to be Mr. Piggy. Oh, I cannot put the dot. Okay, it's fine. It's Mr. Piggy. And now we're going to go for our attributes. And this is going to be something similar to what we did in Pillars of Eternity 1. It's mostly to preserve the same character that I had before. You don't need to do this, by the way. This is very suicidal. But what I'm going for here is I want maximum might. I want maximum dexterity. I want maximum perception, and then I also want some points into intellect. I don't think intellect is going to be as important here as it was in Pills of Eternity 1, especially because of the weapon I was using there. Although it is recommended for scout, interesting. Hmm. I could do something like this, maybe. Just so I, I have a little bit more constitution. Does it make a difference, though? Eh, 
let, let's just let's just keep what we had in pillars one. So maxing might dexterity. So maxing might means dealing as much damage as possible. Maxing dexterity means we're gonna act as quickly as possible, and I want to shoot as often as possible. So that makes sense. Perception means more accuracy, and we want to be as accurate as possible. And intellect, this will pretty much just mean that your area of effect is increased, your ability durations are also increased, as well as your will defense. Not sure how much this plays in for a scout character, which scout just means rogue multi-classed with a ranger. I'm gonna take it because 3 constitution, 4 constitution is not gonna make much of a difference, especially since this is percentage based and a rogue by default has low constitution, it doesn't really mean all that much. So we are very frail, <laughs> is what the game is telling us. We're gonna continue and we're gonna choose a background that gives me more might. So the Living Lands here. The Living Lands is the mountainous region of a large northern island, renowned for its diversity of plant and animal life. Its weather is unpredictable and its ecosystems vary dramatically from valley to valley. The Living Lands are home to an assortment of races in a variety of colonial and independent settlements. This is just lore, I'm going for the might here. This way we get to be at 18, 18, 20, 15. And our job, and this pretty much just means that you might get some dialogue options specific to the job you pick, but I'm mostly going to be going for the, um, the skill bonuses here. So Drifter is probably the one that makes the most sense. You never quite fit in no matter where you go. Each new town is just a place to rest briefly before moving on to the next. You are more comfortable on the road traveling the world. So this gives me sleight of hand, which is different. This didn't exist in PoE 1. We have bluff and we also have streetwise. Explorer. A hunter. A hunter gives me mechanics. Laborer. Merchant. And scientist. Ooh, metaphysics. Um, I think I'm actually going to go probably f I'm gonna go with Drifter because Drifter makes more sense because all of these three abilities make sense for a rogue and in the Hunter it's mostly the mechanics that make sense but since mechanics is the skill needed to disable traps it's it's gonna be important for us but we, we can pick it up as we level up so Drifter it is and now we also get to pick some weapon proficiencies. All There's a lot of new stuff in PoE 2 that didn't exist in PoE 1. So for weapon proficiencies, what this means is... Um, okay, I'm just going to read it. Proficiency in a weapon or shield grants access to a model ability for use with the associated item type. These abilities are situational and may be turned on or off to meet the tactical needs of a battle. There is no penalty for using a weapon without a corresponding proficiency. This is very important. A character who is not proficient in a weapon only loses access to the associated model ability. There is an exception for one of the subclasses of the fighter, which I think is a devoted one, um, where he does get a penalty, but everybody else gets no penalties. And then the models, you, you get the explanation here on what they do. So I'm not going to go over all of them. The ones I want are the Arquebus, which has the aim shot, so again, powerful shot, more accurate. The Arquebus wielder takes time to line up a well-aimed shot. These attacks are far more accurate. So this one I'm going to pick. And then we get some other options. We, get, we, get, we can pick, for example, the Blunderbuss. We can pick a, a pistol. We can even pick magic implements and all that, those things. I think the most important one for me probably is the Arquebus. And probably the pistol. But I think for the start, because you, you do get new proficiencies as you level up. Not many, but a few. I'm going to be taking a very long range, range option. And I'm going to be taking a short range option. So I'm going to go for the Blunderbuss. Sorry, for the Arquebus and the Blunderbuss. 
So this one is the aim shot, this one is powder burns. Overloading shots with powder causes a short range incendiary, but the thick smoke from the blunderbuss is distracting to the wielder. So I think you deal some fire damage in a cone with your shots, but it also distracts you. Not really ideal, but I, I think it's an option we can take. Next, we're going to be taking the same port that we used in PoE 1, which was this one. Uh, in terms of colors, I think I'm fine. Oh, I can customize it a little bit further here. Uh, which was the one that I enjoyed? This one is kind of funny, <laughs> but it, it's like it it makes him look very, very old. This one kind of makes sense for a, a roguish character with the little ponytail. Yeah, I, I can go with this one, I guess. As for the faces, this is this is very <laughs> nasty. Let's not go with that. We are we are a benevolent character. If I were an evil character, this would be my choice. As for the voice, we have some new voices here. No prisoners. They won't see me coming. Yes. Now I. Am yeah, it's gonna be the sinister one. And for the pose, I think this is just like the the way your character poses when you when you are idle. Heroic, hunched. This would be for evil. Roguish. Eh, I, I don't I don't like the style. Sassy. <laughs> it's roguish but looking the other way. Stoic. Sullen. Sickly. Oh, you poor man. Pious, erudite, drunk, energetic. What is energetic? I think I like the stoic one. <clears throat> yeah, this one. I like this one. And, naturally, is gonna be cordoned. Okay, so this is our summary here. We are a multi-class of rogue assassin with a ranger sharpshooter. We have the guile and bond power sources. We are an Earth Orlan with the Living Lands background. We don't have a lot of health. <laughs> this is our accuracy, our defenses, our attributes, and then all of our abilities and skills. That's quite a few skills, Jesus. Okay. Character creation Go forth done. Watcher as my herald. Know that I do not give you this title lightly. Piggy. When the time comes, you will have the power to reveal the souls that cling to you. To open the gateway from the in-between to the waking world. Okay, so we're gonna be Berat's Herald. And we get the power to reveal the souls that cling to you. Interesting. Find Aethys. Learn his plans. When I have cause to talk to you, I will summon you. With a quick gesture of her hand. You feel a sharp pain in what would be your chest. The pain continues, intruding deeper into your soul. Looking down, you see a small lump of darkness roiling within you. The darkness lingers there, but the pain abates and fades entirely within the span of a few seconds. A chime. Do not fear, Harold. It will not harm you unless you choose to cross me. Mm. I trust it will not come to that. Her gauntleted hand gestures to the dwarf hovering nearby. So she she placed a chime on my chest. And if we cross her, she does something? The dwarf nods, contorts his face with his odd smile, and gestures to a new door. Okay. So here we have the watcher and Mr. P. Awesome. He does look very cool. Bye bye, Bereth. Bye bye, Mr. Dwarf. So, where am I going? I'm following this road. This is a very cool intro to the game, I gotta say. Piggy! And that's me, I think. And the steward. Oh. 
Okay, so I think I and it there. That is there, yeah, that's there. So I think I have to interact with my body. Let me check something here before I oh, I cannot save the game. Okay. So I, I'm gonna have to move forward a little bit here. Or you know what? So we are just on the one hour mark. I'm not sure. I, I think it's gonna take a little bit here. Um, this next section. So I think I'm gonna end this episode here. Um, this initial section of character creation and talking about the you know importing from pillars one to two did take a little bit more time than expected. <laughs> I will be honest. Um, but I am gonna end this episode here. So it can be like a, a beginning episode of talking about that stuff, talking about the lore of Pillars 1 and also character creation. And then on the second episode, we get to start with the actual gameplay and story. So, as always, my friends, thank you so much for being here in the channel with me, watching some Pillars of Eternity 2, Dead Fire. Um, if you guys have any questions, suggestions, leave a comment below, as usual. If you are enjoying the content and want to see more, consider subscribing. There will be videos coming out every single day. So, uh, I hope to see you all in the next episode, and until then, stay safe, everyone.